Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Noonday. It's good to see the names uh, and the numbers on the phone as we gather together. Uh, we're ready to begin. Uh, Sister Graham. Come you song for the people come. Amen. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Come ye thankful okay. people come. Uh, Sister Hines, do we have a word for today? Yes, sir. Gratitude is a life changer. When we are facing a confusing or upsetting situation, let's thank God for his understanding. By being thankful, we reinforce our knowledge of God's goodness. Amen. 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 Sister Hobbs, would you read that last line one more time? The last line? Uh, yeah. by, by being thankful, we reinforce our knowledge of God's goodness. Amen. I love that. I, the whole thing, but that that really strikes. May we bow. Lord, we do thank you. We thank you for all things, and there are some specifics that we thank you for, and we will be doing so in a particular way next week. At this moment, Lord, we thank you for this circle of believers who gather at noonday to study your word. Lord, meet us in this hour, we ask. Lord, we ask you lead us into truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 According to my note, we began today in chapter 22, beginning with verse 15. Perhaps we will finish the chapter. Um, <clears throat> before we begin our reading, we have some questions. Uh, question number one, who do Pharisees send this time? And this question is taken from verses 15 and 16 in chapter 22. Second question, who comes this time? And with a question about resurrection. And this is taken from verse uh, verse 34 in chapter 22. I had to look at my Bible because the uh, I can't, I have, have trouble enlarging it on my phone. Question number three. Um, third question, who gives Jesus a test this time? This is also from chapter 
22. And that would be verses 34 and 35. Specifically, 35. Let's take a short amount of time on these questions and then we will share them and begin our reading and discussion. All right, are uh, we about ready to begin sharing? Uh huh. Okay, could we have a volunteer to share your work on question number one? Number question. One. Go ahead. Question number one Who do the Pharisees send this time? The Pharisees made a plan to trap Jesus with questions. So they sent to him some of their disciples and some members of Herod's party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Wonder why they sent somebody. <laughs> <laughs> because they were trying to trap him. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think they were afraid to go themselves. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think they wanted to show their face again? No. Oh, no. Uh -uh. <laughs> well, well. Okay. Uh, we're laughing at the Pharisees, y'all. Question number two. <laughs> <laughs>
Number two says, who comes this time with a question about resurrection? And verse 23 says, the same day Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question. <laughs> is that New King James, Sister Doris? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, is anybody... It might be the ESV. I can't remember which one I used. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Does anybody happen to have the living translation or new living translation? Okay. Let me let me read it. New living translation says it this way. A group of Jews who say there is no resurrection after death. <laughs> Sadducees, a group of Jews who say there is no resurrection after death, ask a question about the resurrection. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> question number three. Who gives Jesus a test this time? Um one of the Pharisees who was a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of uh, some translations say uh, a lawyer. Uh, and some translations say an expert in the law. I think uh, the implic whether the translation your translation says lawyer or expert in the law. Uh, I venture to say that um, there is uh, insight coming from the phrase an expert in the law. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, Reverend let's, Ford, yes, yes, ma'am. I love the 34th verse that says, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was the lawyer, asked him a question. So mm -hmm. after they realized what had happened to the two, you know, they decided to try one more time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it came up with a, it came up with a, a, a great idea, didn't it? Yes. They, they going they came up with a great idea. They, they came up with a great idea. And if you, uh, it wasn't, wasn't a bad idea, it just didn't work. <laughs> okay, let's, let's, let's begin our reading. Um, and if someone would volunteer to start reading at verse 15 and, uh, See, that's about 30 verses in all, give or take. So if you would start at 15 and uh, read to the end of the chapter. And if you get tired before the end of the chapter, we'll, we'll uh, give you some relief. Is there a volunteer? This is from the good news. Hmm. The Pharisees went off and made a plan to trap Jesus with question. Then they said to him, some of their disciples and some members of Herod's party, teacher, they said, we know that you tell the truth. You teach the truth about God's will for people without worrying about what others think because you pay no attention to anyone's status. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it against our law to pay taxes to the Roman emperor or not? Jesus, however, was aware of their evil plan. And so he said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the corn for paying the tax. They brought him the corn and he asked them, 
whose face the name are these? The emperors, they answered. So Jesus said to them, Well then, pay to the emperor what belongs to the emperor, and pay to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The question about rising from death. That same day, some Sadducees came to Jesus and claimed that people would not rise from death. Teacher, they said, Moses said that if a man who has no children dies, his brother must marry the widow so that they can have children who will be considered the dead man's children. Now, there were seven brothers who used to live here. The oldest got married and died without having children, so he left his widow to his brother. The same thing happened to the second brother, to the third, and finally all seven. Last of all, the woman died. Now, on the day when the dead rise to life, whose wife will she be? All of them had married her. Jesus answered them, how wrong you are. It is because you don't know the scriptures of God's power. For when the dead rise to life, they will be like the angels in heaven and will not marry. Now as for the dead rising in life, haven't you ever heard, read what God has told you? He, he said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. When the crowds heard this, they were amazed at the teaching, the great commandment. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they came together, and one of them, a teacher of the law, tried to trap him by the question. Teacher, he asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the most important commandment. The second with all the second and most important commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The whole law of Moses and the teachings of the prophet depend on their two commandments. The question about the Messiah. When the Pharisees gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose descendant is he? He is David's descendant, they answered. Why then, Jesus said, did the Spirit inspire David to call him Lord? David said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit here at my right side, until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David called him Lord, how can the Messiah be David's descendant? No one was able to give Jesus any answer. And from that day, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm I'm certain that all of us uh, noticed a theme throughout uh, this portion of scripture of Pharisees and Sadducees also uh, trying. Uh, to get Jesus by asking questions, engaging him in argument. Uh, and we might even be so specific as say, trying to trap him or entrap him, trying to get him to say something that could be used against him, either with the crowds or something used that totally discredits him uh, teaching people uh, from the scriptures. Uh, 
it's uh, it's an important aspect of the gospel, I think, to see the opposition to the gospel, to Jesus, the opposition to, to, to Christ and the works of Christ. Um, we, we begin with the story, the portion of the scriptures from, we begin with verse 15, uh, to use the words of uh, King James in verse 15, the Pharisees took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. That's another phrase that is used, entangle him. And they send out their disciples, as we recall, we, we covered with our uh, opening question, with the Herodians uh, or, or some of Herod's followers. Notice what the disciples and Herodians or Herod's followers, I'll call them young people. I'll take that, I'll, I'll take that leap of imagination. These young people uh, come to Jesus saying, now they, they're coming to entrap him, to entangle him. using the words of the Living Translation, teacher, we know how honest you are. You teach about the way of God regardless of the consequences. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Uh, any, anybody want to, to, to say out loud the uh, slang saying for what they are doing here? Are they being complimentary? Are they flattering him? What, what say you? They setting him up. They setting him up. They setting him to up. Fail. They setting him up yeah. to fail. Yeah. Uh, do they sound sincere? No. <laughs> What they're saying yeah. is true, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, now, um, let me ask you, sister, something. <laughs> when you counsel the young girls, do you warn them who is going to come to them talking about how beautiful and fine they are, but don't have their best interests at heart? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh -huh. And I bet you remember some folks stepping up to you with a lot of comp true compliments. But you could recognize uh, you wanted to get rid of them uh, as soon as possible. Uh Beware of wolves in sheep clothing. Hey, <laughs> man. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's a, wolves in sheep clothing. And that's what's happening here. That's what's happening here. Uh, and the last line of that verse, for thou regardest I mean, the next next verse says, according to the Living Translation, now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to the Roman government or not? Of course, this is this is set up, and Jesus is it's an attempt to entrap him or to trap him, and Jesus handles it well. He handles mm -hmm. it well. Uh, the possible trap for Jesus, if Jesus had just said straight out, uh, <laughs> we should pay the tax. Uh, they were thinking it is believed 
that they were thinking that he, he had just said, yeah, everybody should pay the tax, pay the tax, pay the tax, pay the tax. <laughs> While that would not have been wrong for Jesus to say, the setup was that if Jesus is labeled as one who is pro-Roman government, the people will turn against Jesus and reject the folk who are receiving his message will begin to reject his message. And of course, uh, although there were folk who were saying that it was against God's law for them to pay the tax, uh, that surely would give them something to use against Jesus. But Jesus handles it well. The coins that would use, be used to pay the tax, he used that to turn the question back on them in a sense. And they are amazed and they go away. This time, now, that same day, Sadducees come forward. <laughs> Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection and they come and they come up with a question about the resurrection. A question that might seem far-fetched, does seem far-fetched to, to me, seems far-fetched, but nevertheless a question. But Jesus does not get stuck in the details of the question. Jesus addressed, doesn't really answer their question directly. He answers it, answers it well, but he doesn't answer it directly and say who's, which man the wife is married to in resurrection, but denies the basis of the question and says, you don't understand the resurrection. Specifically, 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 he answers, you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't, you misunderstand the scriptures. You don't know the scriptures nor the power of God, which is a mighty bold statement, even to disciples of Pharisees, is a mighty bold statement for the Pharisees, the Pharisees motif was that they taught the law of God. The law of God, that's their motif. That's their motif. Not only the, the Pharisees, that's the Pharisees' motif. These are not Pharisees, these are Sadducees. Excuse me for mixing the parties up. And he gives them a bold statement about them not only not understanding, knowing the scriptures, but not knowing the power of God. Oh. Now, I think not only do we see Jesus handling the attempts to trap him and entrap him and entangle him, but I think, I think there is something positive for all believers to use in building our confidence in the Lord. And that's what Jesus says specifically in verse 32. I don't know how, uh, I, th I think this is something specifically that is good for us to make a part of our memory bank. I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Uh, they came with a question about resurrection and a question about what it will be like in heaven. And Jesus in this statement, these two statements in verse 32, I think is challenging all particularly all believers to remember that God is the God of the living. 
God is a God of the living. We don't go through the resurrection to have a relationship with God. We, we receive a relationship with God while we are living on this side of the river. Any comments or questions about what we have gone through so far? Reverend Pettiford, I have a question. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. I, I have been involved in several settings where people were talking about uh, taxes in terms of the 10%. Some ask, is it 10% of your gross or is it 10% of your net? Oh, you mean the tithe? The tithes, yes. Is it 10% of gross or 10% of net? Sister Himes, forgive me for answering it like this, but this is the only way I know how to answer that question. The answer is yes. <laughs> Either or. Either or. Uh, Either or. Okay. Uh, as I as I read scripture and ponder on what scripture says about paying the tithe, uh, that practice is not linked to. Uh, now this is Pettiford's understanding. That pra the practice of tithing is not linked to whether or not we are in the kingdom. But that practice benefits us spiritually. Now with that in mind, it's my choice to tithe on the gross rather than the net. Mm -hmm. And now I personally have not only that reason, but another reason uh, I make it my aim to tithe on the gross is that the practice of tithing is linked in scripture with blessings. All blessings are not dependent upon whether or not a person tithes or a family tithes or a congregation tithes, but there are blessings that do come as a result of tithing. And I want a gross blessing rather than a net blessing. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. The, the, uh, what what is your what is your feeling on it, Sister Hodge? I have always felt that you pay it on the gross, mm -hmm. uh, and then you you, know, you pay your taxes. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and and I, I try to be. Particularly in new members class, I try to be careful that people don't come away with the idea that you pay your taxes in order for God to love you and so you can be saved. Uh, uh, I, that it, there, is, there, there is that thought that is circling in the general population, and I hear it from time to time. I don't hear it near as much as I used to hear it, uh, but I, 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 I think it's still, still circling around. Uh, we're we're not saved by works, mm. but by mm -hmm. grace. Mm. Okay, <clears throat> okay. Um, Now these verses following uh, are the verses which in Matthew prompt give us the setting for Jesus talking about the greatest commandments and the second commandment, which is like it in these two greatest commandments in importance. Peter Ford likes to call this 
the two commandments of Jesus. And of course, uh, these commandments, these verses of scripture are found in the Old Testament, not together, but in two separate books in the Old Testament. Uh, One moment, please. Deuteronomy six five and Leviticus nineteen eighteen. Two quotations from one from Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five, and the other from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Uh, of course, what did you say? What's the second one? Yes. Yeah, the second one is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Thank you. Now, now I, I, I want I, I wanted to make sure uh, I gave out those verses. When you go when you go back and trace them down, you will be doing some page turning. <laughs> You'll be doing some page turning. Now, uh, as far as our 66 books go. There may be some other writings that are not a part of our 66 books of, in the Bible. Uh, and the Bible is a collection of books. In our 66 books, Jesus is the only one who links those two commandments together like this as the greatest two commandments, specifically as the greatest commandment. Uh, now, it's, some might be quick to say, of course, Jesus is holy man and, and also divine. So with divine knowledge, he would know that. Um, I, I, I venture to say, however, that this is indication not only of Jesus having knowledge, but having studied the scriptures to the extent that he links these two together in such in this in this manner. Um, and and of course, um, teach you what is, which is the great commandment in the law. And he says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, reading from the New American Standard, and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. He gives a second commandment, which was not in the, the lawyer's question, but Jesus gives it to him anyway. Jesus has a habit of receiving a question and answering a more important question than the question the person asked him. And, and sometimes includes the question asked him, but, but Jesus has that habit. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The, uh, 
King James says, on these two commandments, hang all the law. Living translation says, all other commandments and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. I think one of the great, let me do a quick editorial. I think one of the great failings of the white church in America and in and some in some places, in some places, black churches too, is to skip over the second commandment. Uh, These two commandments, I maintain, and this is Pettifor talking, that while these commandments are not easy, um, if we keep them in mind, the, the other commandments don't become as difficult. Now, I'm not saying that, oh, it's a bed of roses uh, trying to live right in a way that honors the God who saves us and the God who blesses us and the God whom we love. It, it's, it's not always easy, but it doesn't have to be as complicated as we make it sometimes. I think sometimes we overcomplicate things. Uh, being Well, I think we, we've we all played ball, whether we, you might be like me and never been a, a member of an organized team, but in softball and in baseball, when you hit the ball, you run, but where do you run to first? Of course, you run to first base first. You run to any other direction and you're going to be out. But if you run to first base, that's what you do. You don't stand uh, with the bat in your hand, watching the ball, trying to decide. Wonder, so-and-so said I ought to touch home base, get a home run. So-and-so said I ought to touch second base, I ought to touch third base. I don't know which way to go, so I'll just turn around and run off the field, run back to the bench. No, you run to first base. I think, I think it's that simple. It's that simple. Then, now, simple and easy is not always the same thing, but it's that simple. On these two hang all the law. That's, that's not complicated. Uh, I dare say many times it's not easy. Sometimes the most difficult thing to do, person in your whole town to love is your neighbor, the one you you have something to do with. Uh, if you have a favorite celebrity, it's easy to love them. It might not be so easy sometimes when you hear bad things about them, but until then, it's easy to love. Uh, a neighbor can be more difficult to love. A family member at times can be difficult to love, but it's simple. It's simple. The importance of it is simple. But again, again, even there, we remember uh, it was saved by grace and not by works. But to borrow from Paul, we do the best we can. In so much as possible, we live, we live peaceably with our neighbors. Any, any comments uh, or discussion about, about that portion of our of our scripture today? Would anybody agree that the beautiful thing about church life? Is that you have a group of people for the who who are trying to live out these two commandments? Church, yes. 
Yeah. I, I don't think I don't think you would argue with me if I say church is not perfect. But church is a place where you can find folk whose mind most of the time is on trying to live out these two commandments. Now, everybody in churches, everybody in church life may not agree on what God wants us to do. But I think mo for the most part, wherever you go in church, even when you visit a church who, whose ways and whose activities are vastly different from what you know and are acquainted with, you will find I have always found something to make me feel like I'm in the presence of folk who have something divinely positive in their heart and on their mind. And we don't always have that experience every all day, every day. Not even, uh, well, we, we just don't always have that experience. But when we come to church and when we fellowship with church folk uh we can we can find some common ground uh, on which to be neighbor let me also say this i have some neighbors and to use the physical definition of neighbor which is not the only one and maybe not the best one but it is one of the definitions of neighbor my neighbors aren't that difficult to deal with. For one reason, I'm the oldest of eight children. And I, all total, I, I have close to 90 first cousins, counting the ones who are going on to be with the Lord. Uh, I learned early in life, the way you get along with somebody is you sometimes look over some things. And sometimes imagine you don't see what you see. But if you got to address everything that ain't like it ought to be, you're going to have problems loving your neighbor. If I've got to knock on my neighbor's door who, who has beer cans uh, spilling out the trash can and confront them about drinking too much, I'm going to have some problems. But as long as I don't say anything about how many beer cans I see, it's not as difficult to get along with. Y'all, y'all see where I'm coming from? Yeah. Okay, let's move. Let's let's move. Let's move along. Let's move along. Um, now that yeah. that's that's not to negate the importance of Matthew chapter 18. That's not to negate the importance of that. Uh, but I don't think we want to invoke uh, Matthew chapter 18 over every every little thing. Uh, I'm pit for the, yes, my, sir. my voice club uh, 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 teaches when I first got in the insurance business, I was out one day with him knocking on people's doors mm -hmm. and went to a house and the house was leaning over, mm. but had a big Cadillac sitting out mm -hmm. there. And I started criticizing. I said, man, man, how about falling down and got this great big Cadillac? And he told me, that's none of your business. You didn't buy it. And that man is spending his money for what he want to spend it for. <laughs> 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 that's a that's a that's a good illustration, uh, Dick. That's a good illustration. So from that day on, I quit criticizing what people, how they spent their money. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that's worth remembering. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them. Now, Jesus has a question for them now. And he asked them, 
what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And the response that the Pharisees give, the son of David, they reply. Now Jesus here asked them a question. How is it then that David speaking by the spirit calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Um, brothers and sisters, there are some questions that cannot be answered at or handled by knowledge only. There are some questions that can only be handled by faith. Faith is not the absence of knowledge, but faith allows us to have a more complete understanding. Knowledge without understanding uh, is not a positive thing always. It's often negative. Uh, when I was a little boy, I didn't understand and I'm not sure I completely know now what was meant when they said, uh, a little learning is dangerous. Well, there is some learning. There is some learning that does not come by intellect alone. There is some learning that comes by faith. It, it can only come from faith. There is some knowledge that can only come from faith. There is some knowledge that we build in our intellect that we can get from the academy, we can get from the school, we can get from uh, training, we can get from experience. And there is some knowledge we only get from acquaintance. And if you never make yourself acquainted with God in Christ, God through Christ, God through the Holy Spirit, you never make yourself acquainted with God, you never receive that relationship with God, there is some knowledge, some understanding you're not going to, we do not receive. So there may be times, there may be times when those of us who receive Christ and who are on the journey through life with Christ being aware of God's spirit, the Holy Spirit. I dare say anybody who does that may very well find themselves with understanding that people supposedly with superior set of facts in their heads, a, a very well-developed intellect may not have. Don't be surprised when someone you think or thought to be smarter than you does not know what you know. Don't be surprised. And uh, because it, it happens. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we get from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Uh, is a little word play on that word knowledge. It, it's kind of a word play. It's, it's almost a sleight of hand with vocabulary. We often do that with language. We use words and then what we say later on counters what the definition of that word leads some people to think it means. One can be knowledgeable 
and let me let me just say it in a way that I I I say it in my own head. Everybody, everybody, including the person with the high IQ, the average IQ, and the person with the modest IQ or low IQ, everybody knows something that everybody doesn't know. And nobody knows everything that everybody knows. And Jesus here hits them with something they didn't understand. And we understand it, stand it because we stand on this side of the resurrection. We stand on this side of the resurrection. Uh, Son of David was a different concept to the Pharisees who did not accept Jesus as the, as the Christ or as the Messiah. They didn't accept him as the Messiah. Son of David meant something to them, but not what it means to the followers of Jesus Christ. Certainly not what it means to anybody who accepts Jesus and is on this side of the resurrection. Any any comments or questions as we uh, come to come to this? And we see that last verse. No one could answer him, and after that. No one dared to ask him any more questions. They quit trying to trap him using questions. All right. He was any their comments? stumbling block. Any yes. He, Jesus was their stumbling block. They couldn't get past who he was, so they couldn't understand what he was teaching. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, they didn't, they, instead of receiving, they rejected, mm -hmm. they couldn't understand, good, yes, next week we will be in chapter 23, um, Reverend Pettiford, yes, um, next week is the Wednesday. Not of... next week. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, habit is so powerful, y'all. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I, uh, I didn't say anything about it at first, first part of the class, but let me make sure to say it now. We will not have Bible study noonday next week, but we will resume the week after, the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. I trust that everyone is gonna have, will have a uh, great Thanksgiving. Uh, I certainly look forward to Thanksgiving. It, it's my favorite holiday. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. Okay. Well, uh, Deacon Davis, would you pray us out? I will, if if, if I could, though. I have a question. The yes. evening Bible study, is that suspended for the next two weeks as well? Tonight and next week? I think Reverend... Uh, um, um, Reverend there, Campbell a... only canceled the 15th and the 22nd, so he should have Bible study on the 29th. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that happens to coincide because uh, the 29th is the Wednesday after Thanksgiving. Okay. Uh, Reverend Pettiford, before we, mm -hmm. before we go away, I just wanted to, I read an interesting article um, on CNN and it was about the United Auto Workers strike. I don't know if it relates to our lesson today, but I thought it was interesting how it talked about Christianity and how there's another way that's beginning to, to look at Christianity. Um, and this, this fellow who's president of the United Auto Workers, Sean Fain, it said he's 
He's just a middle-aged, uh, eyeglasses, looks like a high school science teacher. But anyway, he off, it said that he often carries his grandmother's Bible with him. Hmm. Uh, and when he was leading this strike, he was doing his speech. And then all of a sudden he started to, to say, you know, it wasn't logic that caused Moses to raise his staff over the Red Sea. And it wasn't common sense that caused Paul to abandon the law and embrace grace. And, and then he said, you know, it was a bunch of fearful, desperate people that were praying for Peter uh, in the house. So his faith, it says in this article, moved a corporate mountain it said it actually moved three mountains mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and yeah it talked about how he embraces what they call um the social gospel mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they were saying that the social gospel is is you know we look at Raphael warnock and reverend barber and mm -hmm. um, and then it talked about matthew desmond the author matthew desmond who wrote about poverty and um in fact his book is is excellent but and then it said the most famous of the social gospel was reverend martin luther king so yes you know it's it's like here we are moaning and groaning about white nationalism and christian nationalism whatever that is i don't even understand it <laughs> but <laughs> it said that you know they these social gospelists are saying that you know christian deeds are more important than creeds mm -hmm. which is basically mm -hmm. what jesus was saying in our lesson yes. and they're they're teaching that you know unfettered capitalism thrives on selfish impulses that christian actually condemns christianity actually condemns that mm -hmm. so when i was reading this i thought you know Jesus can use whoever he wants to use. This little That's man right. leading right. UAW has nothing to do That's with church or anything, but it was a a, a gospel that drove him mm -hmm. to lead this movement. And he they were victorious in it. Yes, yes, yes. That's 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 a wonderful article. That's a wonderful mm -hmm. article. Yeah. And I thank you for sharing with that, that with that that with us. Uh, I'm, it's encouraging to me that the social gospel has not died. Right. Uh, uh, and it's a reminder that it's not just in the black church, but that it's it's still alive among white folk. That's right. Uh, Unexpected white folks. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, that. Yeah. That's right. God has a way that's mighty sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Are we ready for prayer? Reverend Pettiford, I just would like to um, ask the um, group to pray for Pat Benting family. She lost oh. her nephew, and I think her sister is Alice, and I think her son name was Mickey Hill. But yeah, Pat Benton lost her nephew. If we can just remember them at this time and yes, pray for them. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Let us pray. Father God, just a few of your handmaid servants come before you right now, offering our most sincere praise and thanks for this opportunity to study your word to reason together over something that is more important than anything else in this world, and that is your son Jesus and what he taught us. We thank you, Father God, for this opportunity. We thank you for your love and your mercy and your so many blessings that you so freely bestow upon us. We pray for Pat Bidding and her family, Lord, in their hour of bereavement. We know, Heavenly Father, that you hold their lives, their hearts in your hand, and we pray that you would comfort them as they need comfort. We pray and again thank you, Lord, for First Baptist Church and those who 
Count it not robbery to get together on occasion to study your word and discuss it and how it can make their lives better and draw us all closer to you. We thank you for Reverend Pettiford and his diligence in preparing and, and conveying lessons each week. And we just praise you for being a God that is so caring, so loving, and so merciful. Father God, as we end this session, in this season, we pray, Lord, that we will continue to be mindful of how wonderful you are and that your wonders that are bestowed upon us are not just for us, but for us to share and talk about amongst those we encounter. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless First Baptist Church and every family and person connected with it. We pray these in all prayers in the matchless name of your son, Jesus, our Christ, and we say amen. 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 Thank you. God bless everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Don't need too much. Ha, 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 ha.